Isn't that a cool video? I love that thing. And uh, I just want to welcome you again. First of all, my name is David, for those of you that didn't know me uh, or don't know me. I should have introed or said that earlier. So my name is David. I'm on staff here at Frontline. And uh, we're stepping into a brand new series right now called Fragile Faith. So the video, hopefully it sets up a little bit of the direction of where we're going, uh, talking about a couple of dichotomies in scripture and in life and in faith. And the first one that we're talking about is Jesus versus religion. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're going into today. So if you have a Bible, I would love to encourage you, grab it out, or uh, for the electronically inclined, turn it on and turn to Matthew 23. We're going to jump in. And as you're doing that, um, I want to ask you this question. And the question is this, have you ever missed something that should have been obvious? So my brother reached out to me a couple weeks ago. I have a younger brother, and he's 21, so he's in school. He's in college studying right now. And he called me up, and he said, hey, uh, I'm having van trouble. And I said, of course you're having van trouble. The thing's like 40 years old, and it's rusting so much that like doors are falling off, and the engine, it's amazing, it's still running. And so he goes, yeah, but I'm having issues, and I have this guy that can fix it, but I can't drive the van there because it's 20 minutes away, and for you mechanically inclined, you probably know what's going on. I don't, right? I don't understand it. But he just said, I can't rev it up too much. I can't get the engine hot or it'll crack the engine block. So I need to tow it. So I went, well, I have a truck. And those of you that have a truck, you know, you look for reasons to use the truck, correct? So I went, this is a perfect opportunity. I will use my truck. I'll go get it. So I went to U-Haul. I got their little wheel or like the, the vehicle dolly. And they asked me this question and they say, do you know what you're doing? And what do I say? Of course I do. Do I actually? No, not a clue. Never done this before. No idea. But I went, how hard can it be? So I took this wheel dollar, this vehicle dolly. We go to his house, downtown Grand Rapids, and we take the van. And one thing that the the U-Haul people said, I don't know if they suspected something, but what they said is, don't drive it fast going up, okay? Because people do this, and it's like power loading, and they overload, if you know what I mean, and then it gets stuck. So they said, don't do that. Take it slow. There's a strap, and then don't forget the chain underneath. And I went, got it. We're good. So pulled up. We didn't power load it, but we did it a little aggressively. We got it up. The wheels sat in place. We put the wheel straps over it. And then uh, there's a chain that goes underneath. So I was like, oh, I'll just wrap it around the chassis a couple of times and loop it. We're probably good. So that's what we did. I jump in the driver's seat. Ben is in the front. He's in the passenger seat. And so we drive 20 minutes and we get to this place. And I'm just going to be straight with you. We were both glued to the mirrors the entire way. Just wondering, is this actually going to hold? Because <laughs> we didn't no, right? If it all comes down to straps and chains, I'm not putting my hope in that. But we drove slow. We took it on the highway. We pulled in. And I remember I, I loaded or I set it up so like it's a little bit of a downhill slope for this vehicle just to make it easier to get the thing off. And remember, what Ben said is we have to keep the RPMs low, right? We got to keep them down because we don't want to crack the engine block. And then he's out all this money and car and blah, blah, blah. So we take off the straps. I put the truck in park. And he jumps in the van and he hits the gas a little bit in reverse and tries to pull it off and the thing wouldn't move. It's not moving. I'm like, are you kidding? Is it the angle? Is it like a weird angle that we parked and whatnot? And so I was like, all right, sit in the driver's seat. I'll go in the front. Imagine the sight, right? So here's my brother, doors open, cars up on the dolly and I get on the front and I'm like, just hit it, hit it hard like you mean it. And so I'm pushing the van and he's hitting the gas and that sucker would not move if our life depended on it. And so I went, all right, new idea, change of plan. I'll drive, you push. I like that idea better. So we switched. I sat in the driver's seat and I'm like, we're going to get this thing off if it's the last thing I do, which it might've been. So I gun it, right? I gun it. All I remember seeing in the rear view mirror was just white smoke billowing out of the tailpipe. Like it was just, you know, eh, probably not a good sign, right? For a car that needs work on its engine. So I'm gunning it and he's pushing and we can't get it. And I'm like, is the angle that bad? And so I get out and as I'm looking at it, I remember there's a chain underneath, wrapped around the chassis a couple times. And I went, my brother didn't catch on yet. And I went, hey, I have a, a new idea. What if we take the chain off the bottom <laughs> and then try to get it off? And <laughs> that's what we did. And so here's the true story. He ended up buying a new car, okay? I don't know if we ruined it. I don't know if we broke it, but he needed a new car after that. And unfortunately, I was involved in the situation. So. Here's my question. Can I just go back to the question for those of us that got sidetracked? Have you ever missed something that should have been obvious? Have you ever just missed it? 
Like, it should have been right in front of your face. You should have seen it. You should have known. This one, right? This is just like a life story. But some of us, it gets a little bit more personal or it gets a little bit deeper. Here's a question. Have you ever missed something that should have been obvious in your marriage? Have you ever missed something that should have been obvious in your health? I was looking up funny stats just to kind of get an idea of how do people think about this or relate or whatever. And uh, one of the things I found is 70 million people in America every year are diagnosed with hypertension, high blood pressure. Do you know what I also found out? This is hilarious. 70 million people, 68 million are served by our friends at McDonald's every day. Do you see a correlation? Uh, Here's another one. Um, How many of us have missed something that should have been obvious in our finances? Last question. How many of us have ever missed something that should have been obvious in the church or in our relationship with God? Many of us are missing something in our relationship with God, and it should be obvious, but oftentimes it's not. So we're going to jump in. We're going to read together Matthew 23. Jesus is walking through the area. He's talking to Pharisees and Sadducees and then just common folk, common people. And so Jesus addresses all of them. And this is a little bit, just so you understand, a little bit of a classist society. You have the religious leaders and then you have everybody else. And so the religious leaders are referred to as the Pharisees in this passage. And then everybody else is just the commoners. And so Jesus speaks to both of them and says this. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Moses' seat was this actual thing in the synagogue and in the temple that it was a small seat up in front that was labeled Moses' seat and it was a reminder that the one who was preaching or teaching as they would come with the word of God, it would be a scroll, as they would come with the word of God, they would sit in Moses' seat as a reminder from the book of Exodus that Moses would go up to the mountain and would confer and talk and hear from God and then come down and read the message to God's people. So what they said, this was a very symbolic reminder, is the Pharisees, the leaders, the church leaders sit in Moses' seat, that what they say out of the word of God is important. Listen to them. So this is what he says. So you must be careful to do everything they, say it with me, tell you. But wait, there's more. What did he say after? But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. How many of you have heard that statement before? Hey, how about you start practicing what you're preaching over there? Okay, that was something that was often said to me in my house growing up. As soon as mom and dad would leave, and me being the oldest, I would lay down the law. And I would say, this is the way it's going to work. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. And I'm going to sit on the couch. I'm going to watch TV. And I'm going to eat chips. And that's the way it's going to work. And I went, wrong. Mom and dad said, all of us need to clean and all of us need to do. And here's what I was doing. I was telling them to do something that was accurate but not willing to live into it or to do it myself. And that's exactly what's going on here with the Pharisees and the religious leaders that Jesus is speaking to. And the Pharisees, this is so important, the Pharisees seemed like they had it all together. That you would just look at Pharisees. These were religious leaders. They were teachers. They were well-educated. They were often wealthy. They had status. They had respect. They were important. And so these Pharisees had an elevated status in their society above everyone else that they led. But there's a catch. Let's keep reading. This is Matthew 23, starting in verse 4. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. How many of you brought your phylacteries to church this morning? 
So phylacteries, I brought one just because I wanted you to see what this is and explain it. A phylactery was used in Jewish customs and still is used today. And what they would do is they would take pieces of scripture, like of the scroll, and they would have it and fold it up and put it inside. This is like a little box. That's all it is. It's a box. And they would put it inside. And then what they would do is they would put it on their arm and they would wrap it, wrap this cord around their arm. I have a picture to show you since I can't do this and talk at the same time. So check out this picture. This is what they would do. They would wrap it around their arms seven times. And the goal was to keep the phylactery, this box that holds scripture, God's word, that keeps it on their arm, but more importantly, close to their heart. What they would also do is they would wear it on their head as a symbolic reminder to keep Scripture and God's Word on their minds. This comes out of Deuteronomy 6, and it's called the Shema. And what, what it says is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then it says just a little bit later, Keep the Word of God on your hearts and on your minds. So they took it literally and said, Word of God, heart and mind. And so the Pharisees would walk around town and the market and the synagogues, and they would wear this up front so that everyone would see how devout that they were. And then it said their tassels were long. Let me show you tassel. Tassel was so significant also. Um, just the, the normal wardrobe or attire, they would have tassels that were attached. And a piece of scripture, I think in Deuteronomy, speaks to it. I don't remember what verse, but it says, weave your tassels with blue fabric. So if you look in this, you can see blue all the way on the bottom. And it's kind of a long tassel. And the blue, every time you see it, is to remember the law of God. Think about the imagery here of seeing something like that and remembering God's law and how I often don't measure up. But what these Pharisees had done is taken commands given to them, right? Keep the word of God on your heart and on your mind. And when you have your tassels put blue so that you remember the word of God, what they had done is they had taken what was intended to give glory and worship to God and they had made it about themselves. That it was no longer about their relationship or their standing or their heart before God, but it was about what was perceived of their relationship with God and their standing before him and their lives and how great and perfect and in order they were. And so Jesus calls them out and said, don't be like the Pharisees. Don't have the phylacteries. I mean, look at them. They had the phylacteries and they had the tassels, but don't do what they do. Let's keep reading it. Don't do what they do. They make the phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. Can you see how being around a Pharisee may just get sickening after a while? Can you see how you wouldn't love the personality? How you wouldn't necessarily want to be with it? It's like, man, everything you say, it's all about you and how good you are. Every, everywhere you sit, you just, you move yourself up to the place of honor and you make the rest of us feel like we're not worth anything. And when you speak, you always talk down at us. You never, you never build us up. Your, your role in religion has become such an idol that you need to elevate yourself at the expense of everyone else. Here's a hard and challenging question that I would ask all of us today. Do we ever make the same mistake? Whenever I read scripture and Bible stories and Jesus' teachings, I love to put myself in the role of hero, right? Or if there's a story where there's a victim, I say, yeah, I'm the victim, they're the villain. And Jesus is on my side and my team. And so when we read this, it's easy to read it and go, Jesus is calling out all the stuck-up religious folks that try to tell me what to do. I'm on Jesus' team. Say it, Jesus. Preach it. But here's the problem. Many of us are the Pharisees. In fact, if we're really honest, all of us 
have Pharisee tendencies in our lives. So when or how or what does that look like? The Pharisees were educated, they were powerful, they were wealthy, and they were significant leaders of their time. They were respected, revered, valued, honored, and needed because of their role and what they could do for God's people. That, my friends, is many of us in this room. But here's the problem, is that their worship of God was replaced by their role in religion rather than what their religion pointed to. That because they were so respected and valued and revered, all these things that just build somebody up and make you feel important and make you feel good. But here's the problem too. They also allude to insecurities within all of us. Don't we all want to be valued? Don't we all want to be needed? Don't we all want to be respected and significant and important? The Pharisees wanted these things. They had good hearts. They're not just villains out to ruin everybody's lives. They wanted to serve God in a way, but, but their insecurity translated to having to elevate themselves by demoting everyone else, and they just put this facade on. They would never let anybody in or anybody see weakness or fault or vulnerability or pain because they might lose what was quickly becoming an idol in their lives, what people think of me, how people see me, what role I get to play, what weight my position or my words carry. Do we ever make the same mistake? I have a couple of questions I just want to ask us today, and I call them a, they're personal inventory questions. The whole purpose of these is to help us identify, do I look like a Pharisee sometimes in my life? And if so, how? So here's question number one. Whose sins are you focused on? This is more easy to identify. More easy. This is easier to identify, particularly with kids, is it not? You ever sit down and have a conversation with a four-year-old? and say, you're not allowed to do that? What's their first response? But they did, or why? Thank you, sorry, not there yet with mine. So, but what about them? But what about this? I know I can't eat that, but, but how come they can? This just translates into adulthood. Those that hurt us, how easy is it to focus on those who hurt us rather than those we hurt? So a question, I just ask you, maybe internalize this, maybe think about this, maybe write this down. Whose sins do you focus on right now? Who's hurt you? Who's doing wrong that you don't like? Who is that? Let's go to the next question. What is the focus of your joy, security, and contentment? What do you need? If, if I would phrase it this way, what do you need to be happy right now? What comes to mind? What would it take to just give you joy that comes from so deep? Is it a bigger paycheck? Is it a nicer house? Is it a car that's not like my brother's van? Is it a relationship? Is it some sort of conflict or feud to be resolved? What, what would give you joy? What about this one? What gives you security? What makes you feel secure? Is it a, a 401k with just padding? Is it more income each month? Is it that next promotion or that job? Or is it a relationship that you can take to the next level? What, what, what is required to get you to the point of contentment? If I only had this, then I would be content. And here's my disclaimer to this one. Probably 
the answer to that question requires more than you currently have, not less. Let's go to the third question. Who is the focus of your service? Or let me phrase it a different way. Who is the focus of your life? Who do you exist to serve? Or do you exist to be served? Are decisions that are made for your benefit or are they made for the benefit of other people? Is the life all about you and what you want and what you desire? Or is it about God? What God wants and what God desires for you and your heart? These questions aren't designed to bring guilt or shame. If you're feeling that, that's not our intention. The goal of these questions is to identify, do I look like one of the Pharisees that Jesus talked to? Do I do anything that maybe looks like that or acts like that, that maybe nobody else knows, but maybe I feel? I love this statement. If you're writing something down, write this down. But many of us are just as guilty as the Pharisees that Jesus rebuked because of this thing called pride. Pride is misaligned worship. That's what Jesus spoke to in his encounter with the Pharisees. The Pharisees had this thing called pride where they had elevated themselves and elevated the importance of themselves and how they were portrayed and how people saw them. And so they they had to puff themselves out and, and put on a facade and wear a mask and say, look, I got it all together. I just want everyone to know. And it's this thing called overcompensate. It's I feel insecure, therefore I need to make sure no one can sense any amount of insecurity whatsoever. And so I just puff myself up. And pride is worship not of God, but worship of self. It's when we even promote ourselves above our worship of God. That the answers to those earlier questions that we talked about are us-centric. It's those that hurt me. It's things that I want for me, for the purpose of my life as defined by me. And it's called pride. And Jesus calls it out. Let's just think about this. It was the most loving thing that Jesus could do to call out the pride of the Pharisees. Well, I was in here last night. This is something that um, I do with Brian most times, and I love it. It's just kind of a special time that he and I have together, but we will come in the night before preaching. Um, we have three different churches now in Grand Rapids, and so sometimes we have extra speakers who are in speaking at one of those churches or not, but a lot of times it's just me and Brian, but Brian's on vacation this week, so last night it was just me. And what I do is I spend time in my office and I kind of just finish up notes and craft slides and stuff like that. And, and there's often some last minute changes. So I just, I get the detail stuff out of the way. And then I make my way in here and I turn the lights on. Um, and I just pray. I just worship. I put headphones in. I walk through every one of these rows, sometimes a couple a couple times and just praying for God to work in this place, praying for you, praying for where you're at in your life and, and what's going on in your heart. Even though we don't know all of you, we don't know what you're going through, we know the one who does. And so we pray for you and, and we care about you. And, and I found myself just worshiping and raising my hands and I had my headphones in. And then I came up here and I sat down and I went, I just need to get real before God. Because even though I I just did all of that, I feel like I'm not totally giving you all of myself. And I found out yesterday for the first time, um, my grandpa's been in the hospital. And there are few people in this world that matter to me more than he does. I mean, grandpa's my hero. And he had had a couple of mini strokes this last week, and he was in the hospital, and as soon as I found out, I was on the phone with him within five minutes and just talking to him. And I was like, so you wanted a free meal at the hospital, huh? And he's laughing and he's like, yeah, I get free room and board too. <laughs> and I said, how are you doing? He said, I'm not doing great. 
And you hear the change in his voice, and you hear him struggling, and he's slurring his speech. And I find myself on the phone saying, Grandpa, I love you. Because I don't know what's going to happen. And as I'm sitting here last night, and as I'm sharing that with my Heavenly Father, tears just start flowing. And I get up and I start singing and I start praying and listening to music. And then I remembered that someone else was in our building. And immediately, singing at the top of my lungs and raising my hands, I found myself with hands down and singing quietly. The things that were on my heart that I was praying, I found myself saying them quietly. So I didn't want them to be overheard. I didn't want anybody to see me in my moment of weakness. I didn't want anybody to judge me for what they heard that I was saying. And I got right back to around here, and I sat down, and I went... I'm just like the Pharisees. I just feel this need to project and this need to say, I have it all together. I don't have need. I don't have pain. I'm tough. And yet what Jesus said to the Pharisees is, yes, you do. Pride clouds our ability to see us the way that we actually are. That it has the ability to cloud our vision and cloud the mirror when we look and say, I see myself the way I am. And in reality, we don't. Because when we really see ourselves the way that we are, it hurts. And it's defeating and it's ugly, and it's dirty, and it's weighty, and I avoid emotions like that, like the plague. And many of us in this room do. And here's what Jesus wanted to communicate to the Pharisees who felt like they had to portray, and felt like they had to wear a mask, and felt like they had to have it all together. Jesus said to them, no, you don't. Because there is only one life lived that was perfect. And it wasn't you. And there's only one person who can save us for eternity. And it's not you. And there's only one who is worthy of our worship. And it's not you. His name is Jesus. I want to put these questions back up on the screen. Whose sins are you focused upon? There's an easy answer, which is everyone else. And there's a much harder answer that's mine. What do you need to confess? or share with your heavenly father about how you're really doing, about what you're really struggling with, about where you're really at in life. What is the focus of your joy and security and contentment? Is it your relationship with Jesus? If not, how can you give up the things that get in the way of that to achieve the real version of joy, of contentment, of security? And then here's the last question. Who's the focus of your service? Who's the focus of your life? Who do you exist for? Is it for you and for yourself and for everything that everything works according to me and for my purposes and my will, for my glory? Amen. Or is it for the creator of the universe who knows you, loves you, saw you at your worst moment and said, I am so madly in love with you 
then I will pay any price for you. We all worship something. And what we worship today is indicative of where we will be a thousand years from now. And that's why the most loving thing that Jesus could have done to the Pharisees is to call out what he saw because they had elevated their worship of themselves above God. And Jesus said, that's not going to work for you in the end because that leads to a path of destruction. But you can realign that if you worship God our Father and Jesus as his Son And allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life and in your heart and in your mind. He will bring total transformation. And your worship of God will be put back in its rightful place. That is what he desires for you. So as we go into this next song, I just want you to take a couple minutes. And just approach God like I did last night, sitting right here on the step. Say, God, here's where I'm at. Here's what I'm holding on to. Here's where I'm struggling. Here's where I'm hurting. I'm not going to lie to you because you already know the answer anyway. I'm not going to lie to myself because I've done that enough. God, here's where I'm at and you need to know and I just need you right now. And allow your response to him moving in your direction transforming your heart, reminding you that he's there and he's close and he's present. Let your response be total, unabandoned worship. God, we just come before you today. So grateful that you are our God and that you love us. God, we don't deserve you. We've hurt so many people carry so much baggage oftentimes we just we can't even stand the look of ourselves and yet you remind us constantly throughout scripture that we are your creation that you created us and made us in your own image and likeness and you are so in love with us that you would do anything to rescue us from ourselves God, thank you for meeting us in our spot. And I just pray right now, Father, that through your spirit, you would just work in the hearts of your people and that you would identify things or relationships or brokenness in our hearts that are preventing us from seeing you the way that you truly are and worshiping you for who you really are. God, I pray that we would confess that to you right now. I pray that we would give that up, that we would relinquish control to you and that you would move into our hearts and bring healing and hope and mercy and grace and forgiveness and life. Thank you for your son, Jesus. I'll pray this in the name of Jesus.